Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I'm a dental surgeon and also the course director for an online series of lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology uh, into their practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the online didactic portion. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 9, Part 3 of the Prosthetic Phase. So in Part 3, basically what we're going to go over are restorations. And as you can see from this diagram, we're going to start off by talking about things that are relatively simple, single crowns, and then we're going to basically progress downwards. The red arrow on the right basically indicates the increased complexity and increased skill which is required in order to do uh, bigger cases and the one thing I forgot in there was the E, the experience. So for people first starting out in uh, restoration of implant dentistry, even su the surgical placement of in implant dentistry, you probably want to start off with something simple like a single crown then progress to something like a bridge and then perhaps look at things like implant supported uh, removable dentures, implant supported removable partial dentures before you go to the fixed things like the metal hybrid dentures and the implant supported complete porcelain dentures. So the doctrine, dogma, tenets, gospel, the law. These are things that I want you to keep in mind uh, when referring to the, the past red arrow but also uh, you have to learn to walk before you can run and in this sense we're basically trying to say that things like a single crown are probably the most important thing to try to master before you move on to bigger things. The basic principles of prosthodontics apply here. The game is the same, the players have changed a bit. So implant dentistry hasn't really changed our jobs uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a major sort of sense. The basic principles still apply. We are still dealing with warm bodies that have habits and patterns of use that are time tested and true. And as such, treatment planning, other than the fact that you now have implants to add as a modality or a discipline to the treatment plan, uh, the, you know, the overall principles are still the same. Communication with your lab is also imperative in these cases and surprises in implant dentistry, as, we, as we've said many times in this lecture series, are never a good thing. So let's start off with single crowns. So single crowns can be challenging from an aesthetic perspective, especially in the anterior. The majority of single crown cases that we probably get are, you know, the uh, somebody through some type of trauma was missing a central or lateral incisor. So in order to address the uh, aesthetic concerns, you have to be uh, sure that you have an excellent impression for the patient. There's an old expression we used to use in, in, in dental school, which was if you uh, send the lab garbage, they're going to send you back garbage. So garbage in, garbage out. Remember that the lab many times doesn't necessarily have all of the uh, details or the benefit of seeing the patient that you have. So you need to tell your lab the implant brand, the type of platform which it is, the type of abutment which you want, uh, whether that be uh, metal or uh, ceramic uh, or you know like a gold uh, UCLA type or just say a, a totally cast abutment, uh, the type of screw access hole, whether that be uh, whether that's going to be a screw retained or a cemented uh, a crown, the gingival contour that you're seeking, the occlusion, the shade, etc. But one of the things you can really do to sort of help your lab is have some type of a very detailed lab prescription. So this is just a copy of a lab script I took from a particular lab, but you need to sort of see the detail of information that you can send. It's not just, you know, please send me a crown. Uh, you know, there's all types of details with respect to the, the shade, the type of porcelain, uh, the type of staining that you want, the type of translucency, the type of embrasures, uh, the type of, uh, of a design for if it's a porcelain fused to metal. So how much porcelain do you want? How much metal do you want? And where is it supposed to be? What the contacts are supposed to be like? What the interproximal contacts are supposed to be like? So if you can just sort of visualize uh, this picture and keep this in mind when communicating with your lab, but also it's also a matter of sending your lab a good uh, 
uh, shade. So I personally like using this from Ivoclar Vivadence called the Chromascope. And what I like about it is it really sort of breaks things down in terms of the actual chroma, right? So the actual chroma of the tooth. And then there's different value differences that are built in. But I've never really had to send a patient for custom shading since I started using this shade guide as compared to the standard Vita A1, A2, A3 shade guide. Now, uh, with that being said, I never really tried the Vita 3D shade guide. I could never actually quite figure it out. It was always like this, like, like uh, some sort of a complicated game. Like you got to grab some space monkey alien or something like that and come up with the different types of numbers. Then you have also have to try to communicate that to the lab and hope that they can sort of decode uh, the same way you coded uh, that Vita shade, 3D shade guide uh, to uh, what they have in their lab. So I always found the chromoscope to be very easy uh, to use and I haven't had any issues. Finally, the last thing you can send your lab is a picture. A picture is worth a thousand words. Let's take a look at this next picture. So in this picture, you can see this patient's got all types of things going on in terms of the gingival zenith, in terms of uh, the incisal translucency, in terms of incisal shapes, in terms of to craze lines, stains, restorations, even amongst the individual teeth, there's probably like at least two or three different shades going on in different areas. So sending the lab a picture is worth a thousand words. This is actually going to be the case that we're going to talk about uh, in our case presentation for a single crown. And you'll notice that the upper right during this picture is the it's, it's on the right, but it's actually the left the lateral incisor. So the, uh, on the upper right here, that lateral incisor is the implant crown. So let's take a look at a case here. It's a 56-year-old healthy female patient who presents with a missing uh, lateral incisor. And this was due to a failed endodontically treated tooth. So you can see in this uh, panoral radiograph here that we have adequate, <clears throat> what appears to be adequate height of bone, <clears throat> adequate root form, and appears to be a case that we should be able to address this lady's uh, concerns. However, when we take a look at the periapical radiograph, you can see as a result of the failed endodontically treated tooth that there is a fairly large uh, bicolingual uh, bone defect that's going to need to be addressed. Uh, you will notice though, in approximately the bone has been maintained, and as a, as a result of that, we go back to the studies by Tarnow that the as long as the bone is five millimeters from the contact point, that papilla is going to be man maintained. So in this case, that was one thing that we did not have to be concerned about. So the treatment plan for this lady, of course, consent, photos, models, a wax up, some form of sanitive treatment to get things down to a basic level of oral health. And then uh, basically we we'll proceed with an implant with a platelet-rich fibrin sticky bone graft. So this is using the IPRF uh, protocol. So basically what we just do here is we uh, do some sort of a, a, a pocket uh, formation uh, on the buccal aspect. We graft some bone and we inject it with sticky bone and uh, or the injectable PRF that becomes rock hard after about a minute and then we basically go ahead and place our implant and that provides you with excellent stability of the uh, bone graft such that uh, it's going to heal really uh, nicely. We're going to give this patient four months of healing time and then finally we're going to give her the provision of a screw retained crown and then lastly a bite plate in order to make sure that um, the bruxism, the the uh, grim reaper of dentistry doesn't uh, cause uh, problems for all this hard work that we've done. So we'll take a look at this case here. We'll retract the tissue and you can see where uh, this patient is missing the tooth. And there's the implant that has been placed using that protocol that I had described with the sticky bone. Notice we, we kept the uh, buccal tissues intact. We didn't reduce the amount of blood flow uh, to the periosteum by lifting it up. Uh, and also by also reducing the amount of uh, blood flow to that interproximal bone, uh, a trick I learned uh, a long time ago from a periodontist colleague of mine. And in, in this sense, you're going to have the most uh, likely or the most predictable um, pre predictable uh, long-term solution in terms of maintaining those interproximal papillae for this patient. We get some platelet-rich fibrin. Uh, once again, here's a a little bit more platelet rich fibrin. This is a membrane, not the injectable version. And we suture that on top. The patient comes back. Uh, there's a picture, a radiograph of the actual procedure done. You can see that we were able to get some nice bone there for the patient. The patient comes back and that's what the patient looks like uh, four months later. We take a radiograph, see that everything is nice and stable. We take a fixture level impression. So uh, we place the impression coping. Uh, this is going to be a screw retained access hole. We take a radiograph to ensure that that impression coping is seated. Then we get a tray, in this case it's a stock Teledyne water pick uh, tray. Make a hole on top of it, try it inside the mouth and basically ensure that we can access that, uh, that hole so that the uh, whole impression and 
uh, impression coping, uh, open tray impression coping uh, can be removed uh, easily uh, all at the same time. So we go ahead and take that impression and here's that impression uh, removed. You can see that we use a combination of light and heavy body. You need light body for detail. Yeah, you, you need the heavy body for the rigidity around that impression coping. I like placing the uh, fixture analogs onto my patients uh, myself, as described previously, I don't like uh, there being any air or you know, things spinning around because there is a bit of a hex in there. If you spin it or try to tighten it too much and then you're trying to figure out uh, what the actual uh, relationship was and then you get a crown that doesn't fit and all types of other issues. So this is one way to ensure that there's going to be no error there by putting it on yourself. And here's another the photograph just demonstrating that, uh, that uh, analog in place. I like having everything sort of in these old school uh, dental trays that you know we had you know uh, I started practicing back in 2001 and an old colleague of mine basically said that he liked using these little trays uh, for various things in uh, you know standard dentistry you know, amalgams composites those things we used to do so I found these things very useful for sort of just breaking things down you can see in the bottom I have my healing abutment soaking in some chlorhexidine you can use the 0.125 or the 0.25 sodium hypochlorite rinse that we've described in the past. You got the impression coping, you got the analog, you get your screwdriver, and you have your UCLA abutment that you're ready to send off to your lab. So uh, we clean everything up, put a three millimeter healing abutment on, as you can see from the big three uh, indicated on this healing abutment. Um, patient comes back, we try the crown in. So it's the same thing as any other crown. So you check your contacts and then you want to check your margins. And by checking your margins, that means taking a periapical radiograph. As you can see in this photograph here, the crown is not seated. And now it is. So the crown may not seat as a result of either some soft or hard tissue interference. Sometimes it's also due to the fact that the contacts are too tight. So you check your crown, you check your contacts, you check your margins via radiograph, and then lastly, you check your occlusion. So once that, all those things have been cleared up, we usually wait uh, 10 or 15 minutes to retorque the uh, crown to 30 newton centimeters. Once again, that's to deal with that settling effect uh, of the screw to ensure that that screw is not going to get loose. Uh, put some Teflon inside there. In our office, we like usually taking some bond and uh, putting that onto the uh, occlusal or orifice and then filling that up with your favorite type of composite resin or composite resin uh, material. And as you can see from this picture here, you can see the screw access holes on the lingual and we've already seen the, the final result. And once again, I just sent this off to the lab uh, with a... Uh, chromoscope shade and uh, with a photograph and the lab was able to give us back a result that was very uh, aesthetically uh, acceptable for this patient and this case went fairly, fairly well and you can see the papilla had been maintained as well uh, which is also a nice uh, a nice uh, nice benefit so going to the next uh, type of case or the next uh, order of difficulty would be the fixed partial denture also known as the bridge so what do we want to talk about here so basic things to know here is that you cannot bridge an implant to a natural tooth. The problem with this is that natural teeth, as we discussed back in, in lecture one, natural teeth have a periodontal ligament to them, which acts like a little bit of a shock absorber. So natural teeth have a bit of movement to them. Uh, as Unlike the 1978 Harvard criteria for uh, definition of implant success, where mobility was acceptable, uh, the Zarb, Albrecht, and Carlson model basically stated that there should be no movement for an implant to be successful. So implants have no movement to them. So the problem is if you are to bridge a rigid implant to a tooth that's supposed to have some natural movement to it, it can end up causing things like hyalinization of the periodontal ligament, uh, which can cause problems for uh, the natural teeth. So implants are basically like ankylosed teeth, and natural teeth require some sort of movement or some form of movement. Uh, I have seen some interesting designs where people have taken implants and used bridge them to natural teeth using a crown and some type of a non-rigid stress breaker which still allows a little bit of movement in the natural teeth i haven't really tried these out myself but you know they are an innovative design and it is an option which is out there and i'll leave it to you to uh, research that so you want to ensure that there's also adequate support for the bridge. So I've had patients come in who basically said, okay, can you put an implant in my 1.3, put an implant in my 1.7, and bridge them all together. And you say, okay, yeah, that works. Implants are awesome. So the problem here is go back to the, the beginning of this lecture where we said the game is the same, the players have changed. And in that sense, Ante's law still applies here in the sense that the length of the periodontal ligament or the periodontal membrane attachment of the abutment teeth should be at least one-half to two-thirds of that for its normal root attachment. 
uh, and as such, over another dogma, uh, doctrine, tenet, gospel, or the law, over-engineering is not necessarily a bad thing in implant dentistry. So many times I'll get cases in where people say, hey, can you give me two implants? I'll say, you know what? Um, we're not going to charge any bit more, but I'm just going to put three in there and we'll absorb the cost. And the main reason is you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing is going to be... Um, going to be a, a long-term success for the patient. So even though in, in what I'm describing here is I'm putting in more implants and obviously that costs me more in terms of abutments and implants and all that sort of stuff, you're charging people good money for these uh, outcomes or so for these procedures. It's it's a lot easier to sort of over-engineer and basically, you know, say, you know, there's not necessarily anything wrong with over-engineering in the sense that perhaps you're, you're taxing someone's body uh, a little bit more. Uh, however, uh, provided that it's going to be a solid uh, solid result uh, most patients you know, generally don't mind. So let's take a look at a case here. We have a 48-year-old healthy female who presents basically seeking implants in the mandibular anterior. So this lady presents like this. Uh, she's missing the front two mandibular uh, incisors, and she basically came to our office seeking some type of an implant solution. So upon looking at her clinically, you can take a look at the missing two central incisors. You can see there's a fairly significant buccal lingual uh, bony discrepancy. Upon reviewing the panoral radiograph, you'll also see there was a fair amount of bone loss with the residual lateral incisors. Uh, there's also a fair amount of staining in this patient's case, uh, which we're going to have to uh, address. Uh, and then finally, if you take a look at that panorex, you'll see that the root form on the lateral incisors wasn't really, you know, the, the greatest with respect to trying to maybe perhaps put two implants inside there uh, to support two teeth. So uh, taking a look at another shot here, you can see that those lateral incisors uh, don't really necessarily look the best. So the treatment plan for this lady was basically consent, photos, models, wax up. We put her through standard of treatment to get uh, her to a basic level of oral health. Uh, removal of the 3, 2, and 4, 2, their bone, uh, the bone uh, surrounding or the bony support surrounding these teeth wasn't the greatest. Uh, it wouldn't have given us the uh, ideal amount of, say, uh, implant bone or bone around the implants to support some sort of a prosthesis. And long term, it's going to be better for her from a, from a, from a, a prosthetic perspective. So we're going to remove the 3-2 and the 4-2 we're going to place three implants uh, with one in the 3-2 area, one in the 4-2 area, utilizing the residual bone that's already there. And then we're going to place an implant in the middle. Even though there's a severe buccolingual uh, discrepancy in terms of bone, uh, we could go with either a ridge splitter. What we're going to do in this case is basically use a platelet-rich fiber and sticky bone or injectable PRF oppositional graft. We give this patient about four months of healing time. Uh, in the interim, temporize her with an SX retainer and then pro finally provide her with a screw-retained bridge and, and some type of a bite plate. Uh, so that things uh, don't get uh, screwed up uh, long term. So we make our incision. You can see the uh, severe buccolingual bone defect that, that is present in this particular patient's case. We remove the lateral incisors, as you can see in this photograph here. We go ahead and place our first implant, and we try to place this implant as parallel as possible, uh, ensuring that um, ensuring that uh, there's going to be. Uh, basically, where, where we place this one is going to set up the stage for where the other two go. So then we go ahead and, as you see in this shot here, go ahead and place the second implant parallel to the first one, and that's all great. You'll notice that there's a large gap jump junction on the buccal aspects of these implants. We're going to graft this and place the sticky bone in this area as well. Uh, there's the two implants in place, and you can see now we've placed the third implant, and there's, there's a significant dehiscence or fenestration uh, for this implant. We're going to graft some, sorry, put the cover screws on first because you don't have bone graft going into the implants. And then finally, uh, take some blood from the patient uh, from their antecubital fossa and basically put that into a centrifuge, spin that down uh, for around two minutes, at, uh, two to three minutes at 700 RPM. And then basically you, just pull, you suck out the top section of this and re moving rather quickly because this will start to clot or become a fibrin clot. You spray that on top of the bone graft that you placed for the patient, put some platelet-rich fibrin membrane on top, stitch this up, and then basically this patient gets a Essex retainer and this is what things are gonna be like for the next four months. So the patient comes back a week later and this is what the tissues look like. We remove the sutures and that's what we have. Now, uh, don't be fooled, the, uh, some of the buccolingual expansion that you've seen here is, is a swelling of the tissue. The patient comes back four months later and realistically speaking, that's what you're uh, that's what you're going to get. So what we do now is basically make a incision for a stage two procedure, remove the cover screws for this patient, and uh, place some impression copings. We take an X-ray to make sure that those impression copings are seated. 
Uh, I like locking my impression copings together, as should you. You don't want any movement of those copings relative to one another, or you may potentially get a bridge back that doesn't necessarily fit. Uh, and you know, unlike those things in the old days where you could section the copings and blah blah, blah. this is this is like, it literally takes like you know, it costs five dollars. Uh, it takes five minutes. Just splint them together with something solid. So I like using composite resin. Uh, you can also use uh, Duralay, uh, uh, Duralay pattern resin or GC pattern resin, uh, which is also an excellent one to use. They're a little bit cheaper to use. I just find them a little bit more difficult to handle. Hey, I'm a general dentist. I you know do tons of uh, tons of composites, so it, it works well to flow in my hands. Uh, so basically, light cure this, and uh, basically. Uh, that's everything locked in place. While we're at this stage here, just want to add, uh, using something like triad is probably the worst. And the problem with triad, there was a study done between composite, GC pattern resin, and, and triad. They basically found that the, the most accurate or least amount of polymerization shrinkage was the, uh, the GC pattern resin followed by composite. And hands down, the worst was using uh, the triad, which was the light cured uh, polymethyl methacrylate material. So uh, once again, we take a tray and we try it inside the mouth and make sure that there is a, a screw access hole so that we can take an impression of this so there's the screw retained um, sorry the open tray uh, impression of this uh, particular case and once again i add the uh, the uh, fixture analogs on for the patient and here's another photograph just demonstrating uh, the fixture analogs in place and the parallelism of those implants uh, we place a bunch of healing abutments for the patient and as you can see the teeth are nice and clean now send this patient away uh, for uh, you know the time it takes the lab to make these uh, prostheses the prosthesis comes back make sure that you check your prosthesis on your model with and, and, and without that gingival mask to ensure that it is seated if it's not going to seat on the model uh, how can you expect it to seat inside the mouth so just check from the buccal and lingual put the gingival mask back in place also take a look at the emergence profile for the patient so our patient comes back, as you can see, in a matter of just two weeks, she's managed to get a fair amount of buildup on the teeth and around my healing abutment. So you say, thanks. And you basically have to speak to this patient about oral hygiene practices and keeping things nice and clean. Uh, so here's the patient with the healing abutments on again. Those are the healing abutments removed. You can see that the tissue does nonetheless look nice and healthy uh, after we cleaned everything up for her. And in the next shot, here you can see our bridge is in place. Uh, and we've screwed that down. There's a bit of white on the tissue, but that'll go away after about five, 10 minutes. And here's a radiograph showing uh, that prosthesis in place. So the next case we're gonna go towards is called implant supported removable complete dentures. So the nice thing about implant supported removable complete dentures is it drastically improves upon the retention and the stability of the dentures for the patients. It reduces the reliance upon acrylic flanges and soft tissue for support. Very important to tell your patients that they still need to be removed at night. And patients always ask, why do I need to take them off at night? And I say to patients, do you take your shoes off at nighttime? You take your socks off at nighttime? You know, do you, you change your clothes? Like, I mean, you have to give your body time to rest. And similarly, you have to give your soft tissues time to rest. They're also a lot easier to maintain as compared to fixed restorations. A lot of people think, well, doc, should I get a removable restoration or should I get a fixed restoration? And I just tell them it's a lot easier to take the denture out, clean it, clean the bar, clean the attachments and all that stuff, as opposed to having to get the, uh, the proxa brushes and you know super floss and all those other wonderful things to try to clean the dentures. They also require routine maintenance and care. This is also another important thing to communicate to your patients that just because they're you know getting you know expensive dentures done doesn't mean they have to stop coming to see you or they you know pay the bill and walk out the door and they're gone for 20 years. They still need to come back. They still need to have the dentures cleaned and polished. They still need to have the locator attachments if they're using locators or hater clips or any of those sorts of things. They need to be changed and modified. So this can look anything like this fancy gizmo here. This patient here had a severe, severely atrophic maxilla and had some zygomatic uh, implants placed by a colleague of mine 15 years ago. This is this prosthesis is still in place. You can see that these are connected together with a cast bar with three locator attachments. And this patient's very happy with the prosthesis which he has. To something like this, where we have a bunch of implants placed in the patient's maxilla for a removable bar and a couple of locators in the mandible, to a case like this, where we have a patient, even though she has an opposing natural dentition, she had very robust bone in the maxilla. This is this is five years in function. Uh, we basically placed two uh, locator attachments for her in the maxilla. Now, in this particular case, 
the attachments were basically being used to augment the retention of our existing denture design. So this is not an open palette design, very important. This is a closed palette. All of the uh, all of the acrylic extensions on this denture, so all of the soft tissue support is being maximized and basically the locators are giving her additional retention for her, dent for her denture. Uh, to a case like this where a patient basically wanted four uh, implants in the mandible uh, to uh, help retain her lower prosthesis. So let's take a look at a case. It's a 65 year old female who wants no palate in her denture. And she also, from this radiograph, as you can see, has an opposing natural dentition. So in this sort of a case here where they want an open palate, uh, they usually want less acrylic flanges as well. So they want to be relying more upon the implants for retention than the, uh, than the uh, patient's own soft tissues. And in such cases, the best option usually is to try to get anywhere from four to eight implants in the maxilla and give them some type of a cast uh, bar. Some of the new CAD CAM titanium bars that are coming out are way cool. Um, unlike some of the ones in the past where they welded the locator attachments on such that, you know, five, ten years down the road when that locator is worn, you got to go and get a new bar. And with a lot of these new CAD CAM titanium bars, you can basically just unscrew the locator and put a new one on, which is kind of neat. So the treatment plan for this particular patient is consent photos, models, and a wax up. Uh, we're going to put this patient through some form of sanative treatment uh, with respect to the lower teeth to get them to a basic level of oral health. This patient's also going to receive six implants in the maxilla with a CAD CAM titanium bar with locator attachments. We're going to give her four months of healing time and then finally uh, we're going to take an impression and provide her with a bar retained complete uh, upper denture and then lastly also give her some type of a mouth guard to protect the bar from her lower teeth and also we're going to keep her on some type of a recall regimen to keep an eye on things. So this is a photograph of the patient's maxilla uh, we, through bone sounding using uh, our 30 gauge needle we were able to determine some positions for our implants and using a surgical skin marker that being Genetian violet we basically mark out where we want to place these implants and then basically we use a our locator drill to get some parallelism for these implants. We place the implants in using a tissue punch to remove the soft tissue collar before inserting uh, those implants. You don't want to get any epithelium uh, onto your implant surface. Here's another photograph just showing you how parallel those implants are. Here's a radiograph demonstrating where all the implants are put into position. And then finally, when the patient comes back a couple months down the road, we uncover those implants. We place some impression copings. Remember to take a radiograph to ensure that these impression copings are seated. And once you've done that, lock them together using Duralay, GC pattern resin, composite resin, anything but triad to make sure that they don't move. You're also gonna do this again, but uh, we'll talk about it in a second actually. So first take a pickup impression of that, of those impression copings. Here's a photograph with the impression copings uh, outside in the impression tray. Now, in this case, we use the custom tray. You can use a stock tray as well. Uh, generally, you're, whoever's making the denture, they're probably going to want a really nice impression at this stage, so a custom tray may, may benefit you more. Here's a photograph with the actual uh, implant analogs in place. So going to the next slide, what you can see is just the another shot of the uh, implant analogs in place. So what the other thing you want to do is also take a, put another bunch of impression copings onto the implants, take an x-ray to make sure that those are seated, lock those, place in composite as well, and then remove them. You don't take an impression of them. And this is what we call a verification jig. What's the purpose of a verification jig? Well, the verification jig, after you pour up the other impression and put the soft tissue mask on, you want to take your verification jig and ensure that it seats onto the implants to ensure that the impression that you took that there's no errors in it. And the main reason for this is that before you're sending the impression or the, the, the model to the lab for the CAD CAM titanium bar, which I may add costs a lot of money, you want to make sure that it's the model is accurate. So any errors in this step here is going to basically lead to a bar that doesn't fit. And a bar that doesn't fit usually means that you got to eat the lab cost on it. So uh, very important to take a verification jig and try it into the model. So we place some helium abutments for this particular patient and she comes back a few weeks later uh, to try the bar in. You can see this patient has excellent oral hygiene and that the tissue when we remove the healing abutments looks just absolutely phenomenal. So here's a radiograph of the patient's bar uh, in place. You can see that it's seated. Clinically this is what the bar looks like. 
without the locator attachments and then we place the locator attachments and as I mentioned previously it's just awesome you can take these locator attachments on and off change them interchangeably if the patient has more retention than they could possibly ever want with four you can also reduce this down to say three or two um, in, 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 case, in many cases uh, the denture is basically made by making a, this is a product called VDupe uh, model of the bar and then basically process the denture to uh, that model using the processing kit and then finally this is the denture inserted for the patient and here's a another clinical photograph of the denture in we take a radiograph to ensure that the uh, housings have been seated appropriately and this is the patient in full smile she was very happy with this uh, with this uh, uh, this removable solution so next we want to talk about the next level which is also implant supported removable partial dentures. So implants have basically improved upon the retention uh, of partial dentures and the requirements for uh, different types of clasp designs. And this can basically improve upon not only the retention, but the aesthetics of partial dentures. So we have a case here, uh, which is a 60 year old healthy female who requires a new partial denture design. So she came to see me and as you can see from this radiograph, there's a number of teeth that have issues. So some teeth need to be removed, some teeth need to be cleaned up. So the treatment plan for her basically is consent, photos, models, wax up, some sort of a sanative treatment to get the teeth to a certain basic level of oral health, extraction of hopeless teeth. In this patient's particular case, we're going to give her two implants and two locator attachments around three to six months of healing time, usually a little bit more healing time to allow the soft tissues to remodel uh, for, from the denture perspective. And then finally, the provision of a locator retained a partial denture and some type of a recall uh, schedule for her. So you can see in this photograph here, the hopeless teeth have been taken out the teeth that need to be restored are being restored and the uh, the the teeth have also been given a, a basic level uh, of sanative treatment and two implants have been placed so those implants are given some time to heal she comes back we put some healing abutments on there for her and then you'll see notice at that bottom uh, bottom right uh, molar it's it's still there but that trust me that's going to be going so then we bring her back to basically place some locator attachments onto the implants you can see where the rest of these teeth are uh, this is a partial denture that has been designed so in a normal case you would have required some sort of clasping on those eye teeth uh, some type of a rot wire or cast clasp or eye bar t bar design whatever you want to call it now, the problem with all those sorts of cases is that they aren't very aesthetic in the sense that you can see the bar well with the locator we don't have to we don't have to necessarily worry about that still relying upon guide surfaces and you know proper uh, you know proper palatal uh, seals and designs and all those other things. The basic principles are still the same. You still try to maximize all of those things. So here's a radiograph of the actual denture in place. You can see that it's clipping onto those locator attachments and that that bottom right tooth that was going to go is now gone. And intraorally, this is what this cast partial looks like. And clinically, this is what it looks like. You see there's no class being seen and this patient was very, very happy. So how about a combined complete upper denture, partial lower denture case? So we have a 66-year-old healthy male who recently had extractions and he wants no palate in his denture and he would like no class showing in his partial lower denture. So treatment plan for him. Uh, so we take a look at his, uh, his radiograph. You can see he's got more than adequate height and clinically I'll guarantee he's got more than adequate bone. Uh, the lower premolars, they have to go. Uh, unfortunately, there's a fairly heavy amount of disease in them, and but those will be ideal sites for us to place implants for uh, locators for a, a cast partial denture. He'll also have to have to get his teeth cleaned up. Clinically, uh, this is what the maxilla looks like. So treatment plan, consent, photos, models, some sort of a wax up, uh, sanitive treatment for in particular for the lower teeth. So that's caries control and basic, basic uh, hygiene and perio. Uh, in his case, we're gonna give him eight implants of the maxilla with a CAD CAM titanium bar. Uh, with locator attachments and we're going to give him two implants in the mandible uh, for locators. Four months of healing time and then finally the provision of a bar retained complete upper denture and a locator supported partial lower denture giving him a mouth guard for that bar so that you know his lower teeth don't get affected by it and then also put him on some type of a recall schedule in order to maintain uh, the health of those mandibular teeth and also to assess the implants for him. So we mark out using our surgical skin marker after bone sounding using our needle uh, the sites that we want to place the implants. We go ahead and we place the first one. The first one is the most important one to place. If you can nail the first one down, you, everything's great. If you, there's errors in the first one, there's going to be errors in the rest of them. So you got to make sure that you place the first one. You take some radiographs and ensure that it's in the position that you want. If not, 
either try to adjust the position or adjust your osteotomy or uh, you have to pick another site. So we go ahead and place the first four implants using the same protocol that we used in the previous case. We go ahead and place the next four and then finally we have some healing abutments with or these are healing collars actually uh, which we placed in this particular patient's case and here's a radiograph of the implants with the healing collars uh, in place. So this patient goes away, comes back four months later and this is what things look like. As you can see, this patient's been taking excellent care of his uh, of his tissues. His his uh, his oral hygiene is impeccable, and the health that is basically manifested by uh, how the health of these um, the the tissue around these implants. Uh, radiographically, this is what everything looks like four months down the road. We take a fixture level impression, uh, locking all of those impression copings in place as per the previous uh, previous description. Uh, place the the uh, fixture analogs onto the impression uh, that gets poured up with this gingival mask material first and then the stone we send that off to the lab lab sends us back a bar and here's the bar with the locator attachments in place and here's a photograph of the patient's denture as you can see clipped in the implants look good the bar looks good the denture is clipping in properly he has a cast lower partial clinically that's what he looks like in the maxilla you can see he's got the open palate design that he was seeking uh, he, we still have fairly significant denture extensions here, but that was more uh, due to uh, the, the actual prosthetic design for this particular patient in order to give him lip support and soft tissue support. Um, and then you can see the partial denture in the mandible. Uh, there wasn't going to be any uh, clasp showing as per his, his wishes. So some type of an implant supported fixed metal hybrid denture. So a few tenets or things to remember about anything that's fixed. And this is something that I tell people, as I've already mentioned in this lecture, just because it is fixed does not make it better. And, and in this sense, you're trying to be a bit compassionate. Sometimes people, do, they've lost their teeth. And from their perspective, if they can get something that's going to be fixed, like I previously described one of my patients for her, psychologically, she just didn't want to have to be taking her teeth out. She didn't care what it cost. She wasn't willing uh, for to, to have something removable interim. She wanted something fixed, right? So uh, we, you should try to communicate as best you can. Just because it's fixed doesn't make it better. Uh, the only thing about fixed that is nice is it can alleviate some of the requirements for vertical height in some patients as you need less height for fixed than you necessarily do for removable components. So let's take a look at a case here. We have a 58-year-old female with periodontal disease and she does not want a closed a palate and she has inadequate vertical clearance for a removable bar in the maxilla. So you'll see in this next photograph here, despite the bone loss in this patient's particular case, when we set things up on with our models and put them in an articulator and put everything together, we realized we weren't going to have enough room here. And you know, you could sit there and basically, you know, take bone away uh, from the patient. However, I'm not really a big a big fan of that. So we talked to her about options and basically in her particular case, uh, the, the, the treatment plan was going to be, once again, consent photos, model, some type of a wax up, some form of pre-surgical scaling for the patient, uh, a full mouth clearance with the provision of six to eight implants in the maxilla and four implants in the mandible for locators, uh, four months of healing time, and then the provision of a removable complete lower denture supported by four locators and a fixed maxillary denture on a CAD CAM titanium bar, and then lastly put the patient on some type of a recall schedule. So here's a radiograph. You see the patient's not centered in the, in the panel roll radiograph, but with everything done. So teeth out, implants in. Uh, there's, here's another shot uh, with the patient centered, or sorry, I think this is on follow-up. And on follow-up for the stage two procedure, this is what the patient looks like. So as compared to the previous patient, you can see that there's a bit of a, uh, a disconnect with respect to the oral hygiene requirements that we have uh, for this particular patient. So when you remove these uh, healing abutments, you can see that the tissues aren't uh, aren't necessarily happy. So this is usually when uh, a colleague of mine, he suggests you have a conversation with the patient telling them they've, they've been really bad. Uh, either put them on some sort of a chlorhexidine regimen or he puts them on the 0.125% sodium hypochlorite uh, rinse regimen to try to get the health of these tissues back to normal. You can see in the mandible, the same sort of picture here. So we take an impression and send that off to the lab and the lab sends us back this metal hybrid bar and you can see in the radiograph that that's seated. Here's a picture of the model. Here's a photograph of that metal hybrid bar tried in. And this is basically going to go back uh, to have some sort of a, a denture uh, fabricated on it. Uh, in the mandible, you can see that we have this nice gratinized tissue around these locators. 
So finally, once everything's all said and done, uh, we try this denture in, ensuring that the occlusion and everything else is going to be good and that the patient can actually clean around this. Here's a photograph of the screw orifices that have been, uh, once again, placed on Teflon and your, your choice of composite, composite resin uh, restoration on top. You can use acrylic as well. Uh, and here's a photograph of the patient retracted, uh, and she can get a floss or water pick uh, underneath that metal bar to clean, keep things nice and clean. And here's a photograph of her uh, in, in full smile. And then lastly, uh, just a uh, photograph showing you those occlusal orifices uh, in this particular case. So implant supported fixed porcelain dentures. So the grand pooba uh, of, uh, of what we do. So just because it's fixed once again doesn't mean that it's better. These require judicious cleaning and maintenance. This is the Ferrari or the Lamborghini or the the Dino Ferrari F1 of implant dentistry. So patients have to expect higher maintenance with them. I mean, it seems a bit, uh, a bit counterintuitive. One would think that if you're getting the most expensive uh, dental prosthesis, that this is gonna be something which requires the least amount of work. I've had patients come to my office, say, I just wanna rip all my teeth out, get implants, because I don't wanna brush and floss them and do all that sort of stuff. And these are red flags that you need to ask people from day one. So from, from my perspective, I've always sort of liked Ferraris. I, I don't own one, but um, I always said to myself, I don't, I don't understand. Why would you spend $300,000 on a car and then at 10,000 kilometers, the car needs like $15,000 of maintenance? That makes no sense. If I'm spending $300,000 on a car, I would at least expect it to you know, drive 100,000 kilometers uh, you know, fairly, uh, fairly maintenance free. So it sort of goes against it's a bit counterintuitive. You don't necessarily think, okay, like what's going on here, or at least think that the maintenance, uh, like some dealers have with their cars, that maintenance is included. So uh, you have to explain to patients that it's not just the cost or the outlay that you're spending now, but that these are going to require more maintenance on from their perspective. They have to come in more routinely uh, than they would expect, and that when these, you know, recare recall visits have a cost that's associated with them and then also they need to make sure that they are prepared for the judicious cleaning and maintenance that they have to require from a home care perspective and if they're not ready for this then they are not the candidate to go forward with this uh, with this sort of prosthesis uh, there's also immediate load hybrid provisionals also known as what they call all on four as doctor <laughs> if anyone's ever met uh, uh, dr paulo Malo, you'll re realize he doesn't actually like the all on four name uh, just because it's all on four for certain cases uh, sometimes he uses three sometimes he uses five sometimes he uses eight and he says, you know, I don't call it all on three. I don't call it all on eight. So why you call it all on four? I don't know. But anyway, uh, so the all on four concept, the pro arch, the teeth express, the Dean to revitalize immediate smiles. These are all the immediate load hybrid provisionals. And with a lot of these sorts of cases, the challenges are knowing when you have removed enough bone vertically. And basically your bone to occlusal plane is going to be about 12 to 15 millimeters per arch and then maintaining proper implant position in the extraction sites and then maintaining the vertical dimension of occlusion and the position of the denture, the anterior posterior spread um, of the implants and what you can cantilever. So this is so, sort of goes beyond uh, perhaps the, the scope of what you know our course here is trying to uh, accomplish. However, just to sort of introduce you to some of the challenges that you can face in these sorts of circumstances. As I mentioned previously, surprises in implant dentistry are never fun. So things like you know dropping a part, an implant, stripping a part, the wrong size part, missing a part, forgetting to discuss a payment, removable versus fixed for the patient. Um, and then basically everybody wants something for nothing. So remember, I hate to talk about this, but you know, patients are coming to see us who are edentulous. You know, sadly, they're edentulous, you know, for a reason, right? They're in some, many cases, it's their own, it's due to their own neglect. So it's not just necessarily about rehabilitating people's oral health and getting people from a prosthetic perspective back to a level of uh, function, but you also have to sort of be a bit of a psychologist or a psychiatrist and uh, in the sense that you need to tell people that you know they need to change their habits, otherwise they're going to achieve the same uh, result. As Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is basically trying the same thing, the same thing over and over and over again, but expecting a different result. And that's the same thing in our case here. So if we're going to basically send the patient home and you know they're going to they're going to smoke, they're going to drink, they're not going to take care of themselves, not going to brush and floss, all that sort of stuff. These implants aren't going to necessarily last a long time. And for those of you who've been practicing implant dentistry, or you know you know will be practicing implant dentistry for a long time, you will get some cases where literally I had I remember I had one case a guy he basically you know convinced me 
you know, he was, he was a changed man. He wanted something new. And sadly, you know, after a period of about a year or two, he basically regressed back to uh, uh, the habits that he had. He was going through some you know, tough personal times. Uh, he continued smoking, continued, you know, having poor oral hygiene, just wasn't taking care of himself. And unfortunately, there's not really much, uh, you know, at, at that point when you know, implants are going downhill, uh, as you'll read in our uh, lecture on management of peri-implant disease, there's not really much you can do. So uh, let's take a look at a case over here. Uh, basically, a 57-year-old healthy male patient, he has a broken down dentition and he wears a cast lower partial. Uh, he has fairly heavy wear, bruxism question mark, and he's seeking a fixed maxillary solution. So this gentleman came to us, yes, and as you can see here, he wears that lower partial, he has broken down uh, maxillary teeth, uh, he has fairly heavy wear on them, he appears to be overclosed as well, and in his particular case, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he basically uh, stated that he wants, you know, he wants, he wants, he wants, a, he wants a, a Hollywood smile. So taking a look at the partial that he was wearing it, using this uh, the mirror here, you can see the, the, the uh, lines in the palette from the partial design, you can see the wear that's on the teeth. Intraorally, you can also, sorry, radiographically, you can see that there also really isn't a lot of bone. So if we're going to be placing implants for this patient's particular case, he's going to require some sort of uh, either, uh, either horizontal and vertical bone augmentation in both sinuses. So in this patient's particular case, it could be consent photos, models, wax up, some sort of sanitive treatment to get to a basic level of oral health, uh, basically assessing his vertical uh, dimension, ensure we're going to be getting him back to a level It's something that he can uh, maintain. So in this sense, using something like a, uh, a uh, orthotic, if you're going to be increasing the vertical dimension significantly. And the main concern is ensuring that someone's temporal mandibular joint is capable of uh, of, of uh, handling, uh, you know, increasing their vertical dimension, some type of maxillary clearance for the patient and provision of implants with sinus lifts. Now, sometimes we like doing one sinus lift at a time. Sometimes we do both. Um, it all depends upon the case and the application of platelet-rich fibrin. We're going to give this patient four months of healing time and then basically bring him back for impressions for a bridge. Uh, in this particular case, we'd like to generally do a framework try-in and take occlusal records, ensuring that we're going to get the proper midline, proper occlusal plane, following the golden proportions. I mean, with this sort of a case, you have so much flexibility. There's no reason why uh, this should or, or this can and should not look good. Finally, we bring the patient for a porcelain try-in and assuming that that porcelain try-in looks good, um, you know, send it back to the lab for polishing and glazing and then insert and follow-up. And very important is the discussion of the bite plane. So in this patient's particular case, I told him from day one, I said, listen, you're going to have to wear a bite plane. Now, I sort of over-engineered the, the, the prosthesis, as you're going to see in the next uh, photograph and radiograph. Here you can see we take all the teeth out, the implants are placed. Here's a radiograph of this case with the sinus lifts done. You can see we placed what is it, uh, nine implants for this patient's case, and we used some wide diameter implants. And the main purpose was we wanted to ensure that this was going to be something that was going to be robust and last. Uh, intraorally, when the patient comes back for impressions, this is what you can see, and you see he sort of bought into everything. He's been taking excellent care of all this. Uh, we put those impression copings in. We lock them all in place. We take a radiograph to ensure that they're all seated. And then finally, we have an impression uh, that we can send off to our lab to have this framework made. Uh, we also take some occlusal records to give it the lab an idea of the midline and the uh, occlusal plane. They're in the interpupillary plane uh, in this patient's particular case for this framework. And here's a picture of the model that we send off. Here is a picture of the framework that the lab sends us. So we try this framework in, ensuring that the occlusion with the existing uh, cast partial is adequate. And we try that in, take a radiograph to ensure that it fits. And once again, Here's the final result after the porcelain bisque try and everything's been set up. You'll notice that we have some metal, metal linguals in the maxillary anterior uh, just because of the, this patient's existing wear. We don't want to use porcelain there to break down his, his existing uh, natural teeth. Here's a picture of the uh, prosthesis in place. This is one piece of porcelain. Here is the prosthesis tried in. We ensure that the patient can floss and keep this thing nice and clean. And here's a photograph of the patient in uh, in a natural smile, as you can see from his perspective, this is the Hollywood uh, the Hollywood look that he was seeking. So the next lecture, basically, we're going to talk about lecture ten, multidisciplinary cases. I urge you to watch this one. There's a lot of cool cases that we cover in here. I will go over the references that we have included as part of uh, every presentation uh, that we have put uh, onto this online lecture series.
And on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for watching our video.